Okay, from time to time we do talk about controversial things, um, and this is one of those times I'm looking at something that we're going to term the AD 70 doctrine, because I think it's probably the most, it's the easiest term to remember. Uh, there are several terms, and they're complicated and made up sometimes. The AD 70 doctrine is probably good. And uh, this is a look at what it is and what it is not. And I bring this because of my own um, genuine and serious inquiry into this thing to know what it is and, and what it's not and what's being said and, um, you know, in a genuine spirit of truth and of uh, fairness and accuracy to know because I myself have known people who've been affected by it, so I think it's worth looking at. And I've puzzled over how to talk about it for some time now, but I think we're just going to do it like this, and I hope this is simple enough. <laughs> we'll see. But um, why this study? Well, uh, let, let's talk about why to, to, to talk about this for a little while, actually. I think it's probably the major premise here, uh, at least today, is why, why talk about this at all? Why look at this thing at all? And, um, you know, for me personally, I knew um, a family, um, I knew a brother who fell away to this doctrine, um, which I didn't know about him um, until I went looking for him and the congregation that he was attending, and they didn't exist anymore. I couldn't figure out what was going on or what had happened. Um, I Actually, it got down to a point, because it wasn't here, it was a, a, another town you know, far, you know, far away, and so I got to a point where I just went to the kind of Google Maps, the Google Street View, with what I knew to be, um, you know, the street corner where that building was, and there was still a building there, but it was a different name on that building. Um, and then when I went to the website of that, you know, with that name on it, I found that it was, it was them. It was him. Um, so... That really caught me by surprise. What? What? <laughs> uh, and that's just one thing. But to say, hmm, that was kind of quiet. I was kind of behind, you know, behind the wall, if you will. Didn't really, it didn't make a noise, you know, didn't make a splash. I didn't know about it. And I think that's a reason for looking into something like that. The other thing was my own, you know, my own respect for that uh, that brother and, and, and his wife. Um, you know, I loved them and thought they were really good and genuine people. They'd been Christians for a long time, well studied in the Bible. Um, so let's look at it like this. You know, the fact is, Local churches are changing. I mean, that's what that proved to me, is local churches are changing. Um, when you see a new teaching taking hold and churches are changing to bring themselves into conformity to that teaching, that ought to get your attention. And that's not necessarily to say that it's, you know, that it has to be wrong. Maybe we have not been embracing something that we should embrace. Maybe we have not been teaching something uh, or have been lacking in something, and we ought to welcome that change, and we ought to welcome those who have enough uh, faith and intestinal fortitude to stand up and call for these changes to be made, and that, that might well be true. Um, on the other hand, maybe these changes are bad. They're not necessary. They're not based in Scripture, and they, they ought to be opposed, rather. That's the thing. You know, when you're seeing a real difference in the church's local, you're seeing a real difference in the, the nature, the character, the teaching, the, you know, the public, you know, the name, the website, all this stuff, you have to take notice. You have to look at it and decide, what is this? 
you know, like it or not, the fact is local churches are changing. Um, you know, and in this in this case, it's a it's a response to what we're calling eighty seventy for right now. It's a response to a different way of of interpreting scripture. So you know, the first idea about you know why we, why look at this at all is, is that well, we need to know about this to prevent it. We need to identify it. We need to see it for what it really is, and stop that from making changes. Um, based on what it, well, based on what it is, it, it's a, it has a real effect. It has real consequences, real people who really ought to know differently. So to that extent, that's an important thing. Um, but the other thing that happened about the same time was this thing came uh, to my attention anyway, which I can relate to you that um, in one of the churches, um, there was a sister who came um, and was asking them, you know, what, what, what do you teach about the plan of salvation? And what do you teach about, um, what will you do? You know, my husband has not obeyed the gospel, husband of whatever it is, decades, has not obeyed the gospel what do you do about these things? And and they, you know, and they were ready to study with him and talk about this and whatever else. And she was glad to do it. Um, and you know, decided to work and to worship with that congregation, which I believe is a faithful congregation. And uh, you know, you might this might be an easy thing to kind of dismiss like uh, yeah that that's what you're looking for you're looking for a faithful church true the problem is she came from another church in the same town and then you wonder why is she asking these questions then you find out why she's asking these questions right the fact is that when she was at the other congregation for previously, you know, many years, they didn't study with her husband. And when they finally did hold a study with him, you know, like they, they, they expressed some interest in studying with him and said they wanted to talk to him. And when they finally did talk to him, which she was glad that somebody wanted to do something about this, and, and you know they did, but then he comes to her with these questions and, and she finds out like they're not they're not talking about anything that you might have expected them to be talking about. They're not talking to him about repentance, you know, faith and repentance, and obedience and the establishment of the church that belongs to the Lord, etc. They're not talking about any of that. What you know. They're studying with him, and they're not talking about any of that stuff for a long time. And she's thinking, what is this? So my question is, what kind of Church of Christ is having Bible studies ongoing with somebody they know is not a believer, and they never talk about baptism in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins? This goes on for a long time, and they're not talking about it. How come? What kind of Church of Christ is that? Hmm. Right? That's a weird thing. Why did it take them 20 years to take an interest in teaching this man? <laughs> well, maybe they're just not doing what they should do, not as concerned as they should be about teaching the lost, maybe. But, you know, you have to wonder, don't you? And she wondered, especially after finding out they're not talking about the plan of salvation. They finally talk to this man who's not a Christian, and they're not even talking about the plan of salvation. What are they talking about? The, the truth is what they were talking to him about um, was uh, the end times, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Rome, the book of Revelation, 
and how it relates to the prophets of old. Was baptism for forgiveness of sins ever mentioned at all? He sure didn't know if it had been. This is what they were studying with him. And so I'll ask, what kind of church of Christ begins teaching the lost with the most difficult topics in the Bible? <laughs> How are you going to start with the end times, the destruction of Jerusalem, the book of Revelation and its interpretation alongside the prophets of ancient Israel? Like These are the hardest things in all of the Bible. Why would you start there when you're teaching the lost? Somebody who doesn't know the first thing about the gospel of Jesus. Well, see, that's what happened. When she realized this is what was going on, she left. That's how she ended up at the other church in town. Well, and it turns out that church that she left was the church where I knew those people. That was the one that I knew about. I didn't know about this other congregation in town. Not that it wasn't. I'm just saying, I didn't know them. I had not been to that place at all. I just knew this family who moved out and that had gone to this place, right? So when I heard about this happening, I thought, wait a minute, I know them. What do you mean they're not talking about this? It was very confusing. What happened? Well, it was a fairly simple change in terms of the sign, you know. It used to be Blah Church of Christ, and now it's Blah Congregation of Christ. They kept the lowercase c. And if you are into such things as I am, as a big nerd, you know that church and congregation are actually the same word. So somebody who knows a little bit about Greek in Latin, somebody who knows a little bit about classics, thought that they would be pretty clever by making a vocabulary word change that doesn't actually change the definition and therefore does not open them to accusations, right? At least so they hope, I guess. But whatever. They wanted to differentiate themselves from the churches. That's fairly clear. There was a big movement years back, you may remember, to change the name of the sign, you know, from Church of Christ to the Lord's people or the Lord's church meets here or whatever it is. And any time you would ask them why they want to do that, they would say, well, the name of, on the sign doesn't really matter, which is obviously false. If it didn't really matter, then why did you change it? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. That's obviously not true. Well, they changed it because they wanted to make a distinction. And like I said, I had used the Google Maps to find out what was there and what was on the sign. And it, it's the same building, the same people, but now instead of Church of Christ, it's Congregation of Christ. But now I can find it on the internet, right? So then I started looking at the website. <laughs> ah, okay. Yes. And the, the homepage talks about them not so much as a church, but as a different kind of Bible study. So I've got this quoted. A different kind of Bible study. Okay, well, in and of itself, you know, yeah, what we are doing in teaching the truth is very different from what you see in quote-unquote churches across America. Okay, kind of like the word congregation is a valid name from the Scripture standpoint. Okay, but again, why? <laughs> What's your point? Um, and that was a thing. And I noticed, you know, there was a bunch of articles there, and most of them were fine. Some of them drew some surprising conclusions, but, you know. I didn't really know what to make of this until I got to the bottom of the study pages, at the very bottom of the page, one of these very long pages, actually, but one of, the, one of them, at the very bottom, there was a link there. If you're interested in eschatology, the study of end times, click here. And uh, I'm not sure I'm interested in eschatology, but I went ahead and clicked. And um, it opened a new page 
full of articles. Big long list of articles with things like realized eschatology and uh, preterist views. And my personal favorite, Greek G165 ion list. Whatever that means. Um, and these articles, you know, some of them were penned by the members there, but some of them were brought from elsewhere, clearly. Um, they tended to be very long and, and, and unclear, actually. But, you know, what it clearly does mean, <laughs> whatever these articles mean, sometimes I'm not sure, but what the fact that this is where they're going and this is what's on the website has a very clear meaning, right? What used to be a Church of Christ is not a Church of Christ anymore. It's the same building, it's the same people, but it's not the same teaching. The name change reflects a significant difference. That's not what it is anymore. It's something else now. And that something else is what we're calling the 8070 doctrine. That's the thing that, that this study is, is about. Um, you know, like I say, the meaning is, is clear. These articles, these, uh, the method of interpretation in, in some of the surprising articles up top, and, and of course everything under the Realized Eschatology link, or Study of the End Times link, was... Um, was drawn from this thing that I now re recognize as the 8070 doctrine. At the time, I didn't know what it was, but now I know what this is. So what this sister had to say, you know, what she had experienced when she came out, when she was looking for somebody to help her with her husband, you know, this <coughs> is not a unique circumstance, actually. It turns out this is a big problem that has taken a lot of congregations, I am told, come to find out, which I did not realize until I looked into it, this has become a big problem. A lot of churches all over the country have been, have, have swapped into this. And then, you know, other churches um, have responded to that. I mean, you'll even you can find lots of gospel meetings devoted to the AD seventy doctrine, uh, to exposing you know the error of it. You can find lots of those um, if you want to. I mean, this this was a major thing, I guess, is what I'm getting at. And you know, before I was aware that this kind of thing was out there, you know, vaguely aware that it was out there, but I was pretty dismissive about it. I have to be honest. Then I was. I was really wrong about that. I shouldn't have been so dismissive. The truth is that it actually is dangerous. I, I thought it was too outlandish, you know? Like, oh, this is crazy. Who would believe this? But actually, lots of people believe this. And then, so, you know, I had, it, I had to break down and say, well, all right, what is this anyway? <laughs> what, what, do, what does it say? What does it teach, you know? Why, how could it be so believable? Um, and it's a good thing I did, because I was wrong about that. Um, you know, the sister who loves her husband and who loves the truth and is insisting on even the fundamentals of the faith, you know, we ought to uphold her hands. I mean, that was the good thing. That was the right thing. She did exactly what she should have done. And she ought to be commended for that. What she reports is that it wasn't obvious what was taking place, right? She's there in a church of Christ that is transforming into a congregation of Christ, whatever that means. And it's not obvious because these people were Christians. It might seem like it should be obvious, but it's not. And we can talk about that. And the people that I knew who were there you know, as I said, I've been Christians for many years and were very knowledgeable. They were teachers. I'd had many good and encouraging conversations with them. Yeah, I love them. But it wasn't enough to keep this from happening. 
Their, their years of experience, their faith, their, their years and their knowledge in the Scriptures did not make them immune to the error of AD 70. Did not make it obvious. And I think that's the, the significance of what this sister did was by, by leaving that and coming to the faithful and insisting on just the, the simplest fundamentals. I mean, you would think that's not hard to find in a church of Christ. Those are the simplest fundamentals. Um, but her doing that is sounding an alarm. That's a very clear warning that something very sneaky, something pernicious has happened here. Um, you know, it has to be a genuine danger. That's what we're coming to. It has to be a real danger if churches are falling to this, many churches, people that have known the, the truth, people that have been Christians for years are falling to this. It must be a real danger. And it is. It's very convincing and very persuasive in a lot of things that it says and a lot of arguments that it makes. On the one hand, you know, it finds ways to be convincing and persuasive. Um, you know, one of the things that it does really well is typology. Um, when you're comparing, you know, the figures of the Old Testament and the, and the, the uh, patterns of the Old Testament, like the flood of Noah, to the things that are taught in the New Testament? Well, in point of fact, you're doing what Jesus taught us to do, um, that we ought to be understanding everything written in Moses and the prophets about him, as Luke records at the end of his gospel. That's good, and that's right, and that's biblical, and maybe it hasn't been done as much as it should in the churches. That's, that's probably true. I know that when I've done it, a lot of times, in a lot of places, people have said, man, I've never thought about that. I've never heard that before. I was like, what do you mean you've never heard that? What are you talking about? Really? But really, I get that a lot. So when this doctrine comes around, and they actually do a pretty good job of those kinds of readings, they're pretty compelling, pretty interesting on that. Well, somebody might find that convincing. They might say, yeah, you know, this is opening up new ways of thinking about this that had not occurred to me before. That's not what I'm doing, although I realize now that it looks like that to somebody who doesn't know any differently or who's been burned by 8070. They might think that I'm dangerous. <laughs> and I am dangerous, but not for this reason. <laughs> um, I can see that, though, like, if this was your experience and you were burned by it, you probably shy away from any kind of spiritual reading or, or uh, you know, uh, symbolic reading of the Old Testament because of this. That's unfortunate because that's actually biblical. The idea that the Old Testament feeds to the new and foretells it is thoroughly scriptural, entirely something that the Lord intends for us to do and we ought to be doing. But they do that pretty well in this doctrine, and they're very convincing, and that's very dangerous for somebody who maybe has not been exposed to it. On the other hand, um, you know, accuracy does matter, and I say that because, you know, what goes around comes around in part, you know. It would not serve the truth to set aside a fair hearing. You know, God doesn't need to be defended from error. Um, the Bible doesn't need to be protected from people misunderstanding it. Um, I want to be represented, you know, accurately, faithfully. As long as that's being done, I don't mind people representing what I teach or, or, or you know, replicating that or copying from it. That's fine. You can borrow these materials. You can quote from them. You could say what, what I believe. If, as long as you do that accurately and correctly, I'm happy with that. And I thought, you know, that's what I want for this fella too, because I was told the guy who started this 8070 doctrine was a Christian. And that's true. He was. He was a gospel preacher. He got his start in West Virginia in the 50s and moved on to uh, Warren, Ohio in the 60s and was there for the rest of the time. Um, 
And I don't, you know, I wouldn't like to be portrayed entirely in the minds of brethren by my enemies. And I wouldn't like, you know, to be misrepresented, people to say that, oh, I teach or I believe things that I don't believe or teach. So part of this study was to find out what does the brother really teach? What does he really say? What is in this book? Is it being used? I mean, is his teaching being used appropriately? Is this a scapegoat? What is this? You know, out of some basic decorum, you know, some modicum of, dis- of respect, which we really should afford one another. And I wish we would do more often. <laughs> I would like to be represented that way. And the truth has nothing to fear from open and honest investigation. So that's why, you know, that's why um, I looked into it the way that I did. And that's why we came to this study, and, and that's why I think that this topic matters in the faith. Um, and that's the majority of the lesson. But let me give you what the book contains, because... It's surprisingly short, to be truthful. The book is not short, it's long, but the content of the book is surprisingly short. The name of the book is The Spirit of Prophecy, uh, which was written in 1971 by Max R. King. And um, in this book, there is a timeline that uh, you can put together which I have done, and this is helpful. Now, the reason for making a timeline and for presenting this to you is because I tried doing it through the front door, as in, well, let's just read it. What does it say? (laughs) What is it putting forth? And I finished the whole book and had no idea. And I do know how to read, But I finished the whole book and I had no idea. What did he say? What is this proposing? I don't know. It wasn't until I got to the end of the book where there's a timeline and a history that it started to make sense, right? So that's why I'm starting with the timeline for you guys on explaining this thing. But yeah, About 1952, the the brother starts preaching in West Virginia. He's 21 at the time. Um, I believe I was 25. No, I was 24 when I started preaching here in 99. Um, About 10 years later, he moves to Warren, Ohio. This appears to be the epicenter of the rest of what he has done. 10 years after relocating to Warren, Ohio, you know, here he's been preaching almost 20 years. He's got a book now. He's written a book called The Spirit of Prophecy, and that's the one that we're talking about that espouses this thing that we call AD 70 doctrine for ease of reference. He's 40 years old when he publishes that book and has been preaching for 20 years when he publishes that book. It's not an accident. Well, skip a few years, right? Skip a little, brother. 1987, he has another book, The Cross and the Parousia of Christ, which reminds me of that article, that Greek G197 or whatever, I don't remember. It reminds me of that. But this is, he called the definitive treatment of eschatology. Now, my point here is that from 71, writing this book, to 87, he has not dropped this. He has not changed his mind or his thinking or his teaching. He has gone further with this and come out with another book in support of it. That's all we're getting at. Come 89, he's got annual seminars. And now there's a lot of people joining in with this thing. Not just the churches, but the denominations now. Give it about 10 years. 97, he founds what's called Presence Ministries, which still exists. And in 2000, that annual seminar becomes a national conference. 
the movement grew rapidly in the 90s. And it was 2002 when Max King himself, the man who started preaching 50 years earlier, wrote the preface to the copy of the Spirit of Prophecy that I was reading, confirming all of this timeline, all of these dates, everything there, right? So while the main text itself that I read, you know, didn't answer the questions that I had, like, what does it set forth as the truth? What is sin in this book? What are the consequences of sin in this teaching? What does Max King call on saints to do? These are the questions in my mind, reading the thing to find out what is this? Well, the book never answers these questions. That doesn't come up. The book, you know, hints at something more, something greater, something else, but it never tells you what that is. Every error, it seems, puts something on offer, you know, there's something you can get away with, there's something you can do that's what you want, you know. What is it about this doctrine? I couldn't find it in the text. Nor did I see what the truth is, what should be said, what should be taught. That wasn't put forth either. What did happen in this book, the overwhelming majority of the book, is arguments. Every chapter is an argument to take down a significant portion of, this, of the Bible, a significant portion of Scripture, to show you that it does not mean what you think it means. Set something up. Say, well, you know, this passage, you think this passage is about whatever, but actually, when you put it together with these prophecies and you look at these patterns in the New Testament and blah, 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 it actually means this instead. And every time I wanted to know, you know, what's the conclusion of this new reading of this passage that you've given me here? I'd get to the end of the chapter... And there wasn't one. There was no conclusion. There was no application. I was completely shocked, honestly, to get all the way to the end of the 1971 text and have not a single answer to any of these questions. Never did it put this forth. I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. What? I read this whole thing. Well, the answer is 1 Corinthians 14.8, isn't it? If the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? There's something certain about an uncertain sound, right? You know what that is, don't you? <laughs> well, how does he do it? What I found was when you're comparing all these chapters where he takes some concept and tells you, you know, this is not what it means. This is what you were taught growing up, but that's not what it means. It means this instead. And that's fun. We all love to play that game. That straw man argument is a fun thing to do when you're a preacher. But the way that he did this was he would take this thing that the Bible talks about. First of all, he would convince you that it was not literal, it was figurative. That's the first thing he would do. This thing that you're reading about, say that Jesus will come back, is not literal, it's figurative. And then, once it's figurative, he can take the timeline out of it. And things that you thought were future just because, you know, in the verses that you read, it used the future tense. You know, you could be excused for thinking that. <laughs> but because he's reading them figuratively and applying them to, to prophecy, these things that you thought were future are not, are not future. In fact, they're historical. They've already happened. That's the modus operandi through the whole book. That's what he's doing. The biblical record of any you know, seemingly any future event 
whether that's the end of the world, the judgment day, the return of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, all these kinds of things get their own chapter. As these future events, he changes them from literal to figurative first, and then he changes them from future time to already in existence, already happened. Instead of applying that to events in history, or uh, instead of applying that to events that are coming, there it's applied to things that have already taken place. And I was really super curious about, well, then what does the future hold? Never, never even touch it. No idea what happens when somebody dies. It doesn't say. It never talks about it. But it's clear what it means, right? If the end of the world and the judgment day and the return of Christ are not literal but figurative, if they are not future but historical and have already taken place, what have you taken away? Accountability. There's no accountability. Which is not the conclusion I wanted to draw, by the way. <laughs> I did not want to think that that's all this was. Because I went to a lot of trouble just to get aliens, you know? Have you ever seen that movie where you're like, man, this mystery is really interesting, and then it's aliens. Like, ah, well, now it could be anything. You, anything goes now. It doesn't, there's no explanation. It doesn't have to be an explanation for any of this. I just wasted the first whatever 50 minutes of this movie. That's how it felt. And I realized all of that just to remove accountability? I mean, you could have just gone with Calvinism, man. Why are you doing this? But that's what it is. I'll show you. Read between the lines with me. You know, one of the things that he said about when it first came out was that he was risking alienation for his firm conviction that the church had not gotten the Bible right. And that's true. By his own telling, he believed that the church hadn't gotten it right, and he had a different reading, and he knew that if he went public with it, people were going to be upset about it. That's interesting. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean that he's wrong. Maybe the churches need to change, like we said at the beginning. Maybe there's something we need to hear. That's fine. There's no such thing as truth by consensus. I understand that. I accept that. But when faithful churches mark this as error, and they say there's a serious spiritual problem here in writing by the dozen that deserves some inquiry. You ought to look and see, what is this? And it's true. They said that the immediate church tradition condemned his book, which is true. His son said that other congregations wrote letters breaking fellowship and sent them to the church where dad was preaching. That's interesting. So he was preaching in the churches of Christ. And other churches were writing letters to the place where he was teaching this. And he said, even family members distanced themselves from us. Which he tells in this kind of, you know, story that is a sad story, but I mean, he tells this to try and gain some favor. Romans 16, 17, though, tells us, Watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine you've been taught and avoid them. So when you look at what they're recording, that the, they were rejected by the churches, that other churches wrote letters identifying what he was doing as error, and that even their family members distanced themselves from them. What you're talking about here is an appropriate and responsible response to error, ordered by the Scriptures, Romans 16, 17. So, I mean, I, this doesn't mean that what he said was wrong. It, you know, so many years later, I don't know what happened right then and there. But it does look really familiar. It looks like exactly what should have been done. If what we have today accurately represents what he said those years ago, this was the right response. They did do the right thing. 
And the author said it wasn't until the 90s that people outside the restoration movement started to join hands with them in this doctrine. So for all my questions about what those chapters meant, the open embrace and welcoming of human denominations and creeds, which is what they called it, open to all faiths and believers, that's clearly the kind of thing that Romans 16, 17 would call hindrances contrary to the faith. That's clearly what it means. They call it a transdenominational concept, and it gets worse from there. Open to all faiths and believers. They trademarked it. Transmillennialism, which must forever remain a movement among the people, regardless of the secondary creeds, denominations, or confessions we may follow. So they said, we can keep being the denominations that we are and also hold to this teaching, and this was embraced, and this was welcomed. This is what happened in the 90s. Up and through the 80s, he kept it in the churches, but from this point on, they go full-on denominational. And I have to tell you, this is not unique to Max King. He's not the only person who referred to the church as a religious movement and advocated continued fellowship with known false teachers. Right? He's not the only one. You got lots of professors doing that. But really, it has to be open fellowship because if we change what resurrection means, and he does, we change what baptism means. Romans 6, 4. Don't you know? As many of you have been baptized into Christ, have been baptized into his death. And we're raised with him to walk in newness of life. If we change the meaning of resurrection, we change the meaning of baptism. And if we change the meaning of baptism, then who is a Christian? I mean, it's that simple. It just goes right to the heart of it. If baptism isn't the way that Romans 6 describes it, if it isn't the way that you become a Christian, a child of God, then how do you become a Christian? Who is a Christian? What is a child of God? That's why they embrace the denominations and are embraced by them. I really didn't think that it was about open fellowship. I didn't think open fellowship was a necessary conclusion of what he wrote, but that's exactly what they did with it. By their own words, by their own timeline, that's exactly where they went with this. Because once you change the definition of resurrection, you change the definition of baptism. And when you change the definition of baptism, you're not teaching the forgiveness of sins the way that the apostles taught the forgiveness of sins in Acts 2.38 and 10.47-48 and 19.4-5 and all the other places in Acts where they're doing this. And that's the way that everybody became Christians in the Bible. So now we don't know what Christians are. Now we don't know who's a child of God. See what's happened? Now we have no accountability and we have open fellowship. That's what it's really doing. Without getting into the details and the weeds of, of how they got there, that this is what's happening. Let me leave you with two simple things. The charge to the priests in Leviticus 10, oops, the charge to the priests in Leviticus 10.10 10 is to distinguish the clean from the unclean, the holy from the common. And then in Romans 12.1, we are the priests presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. It is our job to distinguish between the holy and the common, the unclean and the clean. The study, you know, ends here, but the study of this 8070 doctrine, you know, it was very discouraging and, and very dis, uh, disheartening and confusing to be reading this thing and trying to figure out what does this mean and where is this going? You have to go back to the simple. 
As a Christian, you're drawing distinctions. You're making clear divisions. There is such a thing as black and white. There are absolute standards of right and wrong and of truth and error. That's what we're called upon to do. That's the definitions in the Bible. You stick with that. You demand that and don't lose your way because it gets murky. It definitely gets murky in there. And there's a lot of things and it's very complex and all the articles are long and hard to understand. Okay, but just to say, it definitely is dangerous and it can be very convincing if you let it, if you listen to it for a while. So stick with the things that you know in the most basic points of Scripture that we're called to repentance, that we're called to eternal life, that we suffer here knowing that something else and something better is coming. And keep asking those questions because it will steer you clear of this. I appreciate your kind attention. Today you're not a Christian, become a Christian. As we just referred to and read in, in these passages, you should be baptized in his name for forgiveness of sins based on your repentance. Today, are you already a Christian? Let us pray with you if you have a need in the Spirit. Whether you need to obey the gospel or you need forgiveness and prayers of the saints, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.